Uh, Dan, based on your experience, what are the key elements in identifying and nurturing talent within PE-backed companies? Well, be- before we even get into the, the tactics and practices, I think you know, the first thing is the mindset. It's, it's important for private equity folks to recognize that in a world where we've, we've historically, traditionally thought about ourselves as, as PE investors in the capital allocation game, in this era of private equity, we're all in the talent allocation game. And I don't mean that tongue in cheek, but I, I think it's it's worth acknowledging that the game in private equity is is changing before our eyes. I've been in the space since since 2007, as I mentioned earlier, and even over uh, the last 15 years or so, the private equity sphere has changed dramatically. What, you know, when I started in 2007, I worked with a firm based on the West Coast. We were largely a deal making shop. Didn't have a huge emphasis on human capital. We were mindful of the importance of human capital to investment success, but weren't really doing anything to translate that awareness into you know predictable, repeatable success and sort of accelerating people powered returns in our in our companies. But if you fast forward 15 years since I started in the space, you know the amount of capital out there, as many of us know, the amount of capital out there is 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 grown massively. The number of firms has grown by several multiples. The private equity space is as competitive as it's ever been. And what that means is that, you know, long gone are the days of being able to cost cut, being able to value buy, being able to financially engineer your way to alpha. And so more and more firms are having to rely on taking a proactive approach to value creation and in particular human centered value creation to deliver the win. So We can get into some of the practices, but I think that's the launch point for this discussion is just recognize that private equity professionals nowadays are being called on by way of just some of the market dynamics and LP mandates that are out there to really emphasize talent allocation as a key part of of their job description. So when it comes to how to do this, how to become talent allocators, how to translate talent into equity value creation, um, you use two words, identifying and, and nurturing talent. I'll share just some quick thoughts on each of those. So when it comes to identifying talent within PE-backed companies, the simple mental model I have for going about this, and let's just sort of scenario play this in the context of a new deal. Private equity firm is pursuing or has just inked a new deal with a, with a port co. The simple mental model that I always engage in my brain when I'm in that position is I got to know what I have today, i.e. what is the leadership team? What is the talent that has come with this company? Question number one. Question number two, I need to know what I need. So I'm, you know, I've underwritten the deal to a certain value creation or a certain investment thesis. That investment thesis has certain implications when it comes to what capabilities, what talent, what leadership do we need in the business. So I have to know what I need to make that value creation plan, that thesis happen. And the third question becomes a gap analysis. How do I bridge the gaps? And bridging the gaps isn't just about hiring and firing. It's about developing talent into the new and emerging and evolving needs of the value creation agenda. It can be about repurposing the talent that you have in the business, reapplying some of the latent talent and skill in the business towards new initiatives. So I think about this third question of bridging the gaps holistically beyond just hiring and firing to include developing and and nurturing and repurposing talent, all in the interest of making sure that you're building an organization that uh, really aligns with the needs of the investment thesis. So again, that might be kind of obvious to you know, private equity folks that are used to doing gap analysis of this sort. But I think the key thing here is just be intentional about it. Take the time in the heat of battle when you're, do- when you're pursuing the deal, when you've just made the deal or closed the deal, and be intentional about thinking through that systematically. And when it comes to nurturing talent, I, I think this is the next horizon for private equity firms. Up until this point, most of the conversation, as I mentioned, has been around hiring and firing. How do we bring on new executives? How do we move misfit executives out of the business? But I think nurturing talent is really starting to come to the fore as being the next imperative for private equity groups who are really emphasizing human capital. And there are some very cool examples out there. I think we're still pretty early in this game, but some really cool examples out there of firms becoming more intentional about nurturing and developing talent. And those that are are investing in this area are really playing a different game than everyone else. You know, it, whereas for a lot of firms, the, the name of the game when it comes to human capital is how do we go out to market and hire executives into these businesses that you know, align with or map to our investment thesis. These firms that are really focused on developing talent are playing a different game in a sense that they're saying, how do we actually create talent from within? 
such that we have an abundant supply and surplus of leadership talent to fuel our aspirations, our ambitions for this business. You see this with the emergence of CXO development programs in private equity firms. You see this with the emergence of management training programs that uh, both at the fund level and within portfolio companies. And I think this is a really cool and important next horizon for private equity firms to be tackling is how do we really build talent from within? Great insight there. I, I appreciate that, Dan. Uh, agreed that PE is changing dramatically in terms of perspective on human capital management. And I agree wholeheartedly with, with that observation. And you know, I think that PEs also need to know what they need to make value creation plan happen. And I think that starts with being intentional about human capital nurturing. And it seems to me that that starts with leadership. Right. So how do you approach leadership due diligence in potential acquisitions or maybe stated in another way? How do you make sure that you are starting at the right place? I mean, you did mention bringing on new executives if and as needed. But how do you make sure that you have the right butts in the right seats from the onset? Right, right. Well, I'll share my playbook for approaching leadership due diligence, but I'll, I'll say first that when it comes to how to figure out if you've got the right butts in the seats or get the right butts in the seats, step one is to do leadership due diligence, period. Do leadership due diligence. You know? So for a lot of firms, um, so some firms are doing an admirable job at being very intentional, thorough, thoughtful in doing human capital due diligence pre-closing. I would say based on my informal canvas of the market, Many firms are not. Some firms are doing no leadership due diligence. Some firms are doing really cursory leadership due diligence. And I'm a, I'm a walking case study in the cost of not doing leadership due diligence in a sense that I, I think back to my early deal making days before I and, and my firm really became conscious of the importance of doing this work. We were, you know, by failing to do thorough leadership due diligence pre-closing, it just put us in a position where we were much slower out of the gate than we otherwise would have been had we been thoughtful about understanding, really getting to know what are we buying with this leadership team and what changes, if any, does that require us to make early in the hold period. So I think all that said, step one, just do leadership due diligence, do it thoughtfully. And there are people out there, this is not a backdoor sales pitch, but there are people out there like me who do this sort of work, you know, day in and day out. The, the way that I approach this in short is I always start with the thesis. What defines a fit for purpose leadership team in one company or one deal is going to be different than the next deal. So instead of, you know, applying sort of a generic lens to what is needed in leadership, always start with the thesis. And then ask the question of the sponsor and of myself as their partner, well, what needs to be true about leadership, about the talent in the business, about the culture, and about the capabilities resident in the business to give you and us collectively confidence that that thesis is positioned to come true? And then, you know, then it's a matter of digging in and through a combination of structured interviews with management, a combination of digging into data, um, surveying where we have access to folks in the organization, digging in and uh, developing a base of objective intel we can use to then understand what is the leadership, what is the talent, what is the culture, what are the capabilities that we're buying here, to what degree do those or don't those, as the case may be, map to the needs of the thesis. And uh, based on the answer to that question, what are the top priorities post-closing in terms of changes, supplementations, augmentations to leadership, um, or shifts to the culture, or building of capabilities that are needed to really get this, this value creation agenda onto the right track quickly post-closing. So Dan, are you seeing um, leadership due diligence becoming more of a focus on the pre versus the close side of the acquisition? Uh, that is, are you seeing where um, there's an interest in understanding what they're getting into uh, prior to an acquisition? Yeah, anecdotally, I'm, I'm seeing that in a big way. I mean, I, I see that in, uh, I see that through conversations I'm having in the market. You see that through conversations that are coming up at operating partner forums. I see that just in demand for my own service offering. And I think that's driven by, there was some research that Alex Partners did a couple of years ago that basically concluded, so they interviewed or surveyed a uh, base of both private equity folks and portfolio company leaders and ask them questions about what are the most deterministic factors or what are the things that are having the biggest impact on investment returns. And a couple of years ago, the number one answer for both executives and private equity uh, professionals was leadership and talent as being the most important factor, most deterministic factor um, as it relates to investment returns. And so 
So again, th this means that this tells me there's there's widespread recognition that leadership is a critical part of the investing equation, which then sort of stands to reason that if you're not if, if you believe that and you're not doing leadership due diligence or not doing a thorough job of leadership due diligence, that's arguably professional malpractice you know, for private equity folks. If you really believe that to be true, then it leaves you no other option but to be thoughtful and intentional about understanding, well, what am I actually buying in the leadership that uh, that comes with this company? You know, that is interesting, Dan. Um, the idea of being thoughtful and intentful uh, is one thing because you see leadership teams where their behavior doesn't match their comments. And I think that is something that we see mm -hmm. and that PEs, uh, private equity firms, recognize as well. Right. Um, you know, where, where's the proof in the pudding that they value leadership and culture? I mean, how, how thoughtful and intentful are you right. being versus relying on past um, previous experience? And I believe it's probably fair to say that if you are an executive of a portfolio company, clearly there's management leadership skills there. But success on, at previous engagements doesn't necessarily translate into success within the current role. And it does come down to being thoughtful and, and being an intentional leader in every single context. Well, and in the, in the, biggest, the biggest adoption catalyst I've seen for private equity firms that are not really doing much in the way of a leadership due diligence pre-closing to those that then sort of cross over and say, okay, we're going to make this a core part of our playbook. The biggest adoption catalyst are mistakes. And all it takes is, and, and I say this personal experience, all it takes is making the mistake and suffering the consequences of being slow to the punch on either learning, you know, what gaps exist in management or misreading uh, the leadership team that or the leadership capabilities or talent that you thought you were buying. Um, all it takes is one one mistake that um, you end up learning about deeper in the in the hold cycle than the whole period than than you would have otherwise wanted to to realize that hey, if we can front end load our understanding and decisioning around leadership, um, it's going to make everything else downstream of that faster and easier. So Dan, in your view, what are the most common challenges PE firms face regarding human capital in their portfolio companies? The biggest themes I hear out there, um, really three things come to mind. The, the first is attraction. There's a lot of press being paid to and a lot of conversation around the, the war for talent right now. Um, and we, we see anecdotally, I see this in you know, some roles or positions more so than others. I know, for example, that a lot of firms have had recent challenges hiring for high quality private equity grade CFOs. So attraction is a thing, which I think further supports the idea we were talking about earlier around firms wanting to have greater control over the supply of talent by building talent from within instead of having to go out to market and compete with everybody else for the same, the same talent. Um, so attraction is definitely a, a hot topic right now. Decisioning, Deci hiring decisioning, I think has for, for a long time sort of flown under the radar as a challenge in private equity. But if you just look at the stats around hiring hit rate out there, they're alarmingly low in terms of uh, the hit rate or success rate of executives being deployed into portfolio companies. And so I think there's there's just more, sort of more conversation, more attention being paid to uh, how do we create a process that allows us to make higher quality hiring decisions, understanding that the cost of getting a key executive hiring decision wrong is substantial in a private equity world where you only have you know five years to to make the returns happen. So decisioning is certainly a thing, and then just retention. And this this sort of plays into the same the point number one around attraction, but retention is obviously a hot topic. The workforce is increasingly mobile. For, for some trades or some positions more so than others, there's a shortage of talent. And so it's really putting a premium on creating a, a culture and an operating model within these portfolio companies that can not only retain great talent, but bring out the best stuff in them while you've got them. And this sort of, as you mentioned earlier, this, this ultimately comes back to leadership of how do you get leaders in these businesses that create an environment that can both attract and retain great talent there's also some systems and some machinery that can be brought to bear in portfolio companies to help them do a better job of creating an employer brand that can attract the best out there and creating a culture that um, can bring out the best in people and make them want to stick around. Dan, could you share a general example of a successful talent strategy implementation in a PE-backed company? Uh, maybe just a, a real general example for our listeners? 
Yeah, one one that jumps to mind is a um, this is a company I've worked with in the services space that uh, th- this company and its leaders um, in a really admirable way they recognize that they are in the people business in a service based business. The people are the business. And, and this leadership team recognizes that. And in light of some of these market dynamics we've talked about, the war for talent, they've said, how do we not be at the same whim and mercy of this a constrained talent pool that all of our competitors are, but how do we create great leaders from within? And so they've invested the, in, into the capabilities needed to build up a bench of leaders that can support their growth aspirations. So they've stood up a really cool leadership academy. They've built this aspiring executives program, which is aimed at taking kind of early to mid-career leaders or managers who want to one day be private equity grade executives and uh, give them the sort of mentorship, training, support, coaching they need to grow in an accelerated way. Uh, They brought on executives who have a lot of passion about developing other leaders and have a track record of developing other leaders. So this is an example of a company, a really cool example of a company who recognizes that in order to win, we can't just be playing the game in the same way that everyone else is by having to go out to market every time we need talent. And they have done something about it. They put their money where their mouth is, as you said, and invested in some of the capabilities they need to build leaders from within. And what this is doing is providing them with a more abundant supply of leadership talent, which becomes becomes an exponential game. Like If you can really nail that and create a limitless su- supply of leadership in a system in your business that breeds leadership talent, uh, that becomes the fuel for sort of perpetual growth in a world where leadership often becomes the the availability of great leadership becomes the constraint or bottleneck. 